reasons. One is, oops, one is you have teenagers, you know teenagers, you work with teenagers, um, or your therapist or your educators. So again, I'm really, really delighted to be here. Um, what we're going to talk about is uh, resilience in teens. And I thought the format I would do is for the last three or four years, um, I live in Napier, uh, for the last three or four years, four years now, I've been working with Health Hawks Bay. And um, I've developed and we've presented together a four module, let's make me resilient program that we present in high schools throughout the Hawks Bay. Uh, we have educators who are doing that. Um, it's become so popular. We're doing some research around this. Some of the principles, um, we're, we're, we have some publications coming out. We're presenting at conferences. But also what we're doing is we're presenting this. We're doing train-the-trainer programs for other school districts or areas that are interested in this kind of material. Now, I'm not going to go through the material um, in, in that sense, but I am going to talk about the fundamentals. And it's based on research and the comparison we do, what I'm most interested in, um, again, because my clinical background tends to be behavioral, is I'm, I'm interested in what are the differences in behaviors between people who are resilient and people who are not resilient. My other background is much, much longer ago than, than the therapeutic stuff, is I come out of sports, uh, my own personal sport. I, uh, I do traditional karate. I was in the US team for years. I was US national coach. And at my previous academic setting, I was at the University of California at Riverside, where we had um, the largest collegiate martial arts program in the country. And what we did is we combined um, technical or physical courses with Asian studies and philosophy. So it created kind of a, a large a large band of information that we're able to share with students and develop. And from that, one of the things I'm interested, of course, is resilience, right? One of the things we look at in traditional martial arts or Asian studies is how do you deal with stress? How do you perform well when you want to perform well? And from there, I've gone off into working with different, different sports and different athletes. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some basic ideas about resilience that we know for youth and teens. I'll talk a little bit about some of the principles in the program uh, that we do just as linchpins that this is what we think teenagers and to be really, really honest, everybody else needs to focus on or can focus on to increase our levels of resilience. Um, and so again, if you have any questions, there's far too many of us to kind of talk back and forth, but please feel free to send in some, um, um, some notes if you want Fiona to uh, share them with me. Okay, let me see if I can figure out how to share the screen. Cool. Okay. So the title, the official title of the time we're spending together is Thriving in the Face of Change, Challenge and Stress, Building Resilience in Teenage Children. We use the uh, term teenage children because this comes out of some research articles we've just written um, and, and the work we're doing with Health Hawks Bay. And I, I always want to start, and again, for those of you who are parents, you know this, but I always want to start with the fact that we, in general, do an outstanding job of reinforcing resilience when we're working with toddlers. We do this all the time, okay? And we seem to do it right with toddlers in general. For those of you who have toddlers, who've had young children, they've grown up, um, I want you to think a little bit about, you know, when, when, they're, when they're newborns and when they're infants, and there's that threshold of ability that happens when they're able to stand up, create some balance, and actually take a few steps. And most babies at that point, um, if they're lucky, and if it's and in general, have never, ever, ever, ever felt physical pain. Everything they do, people hold them, or they're surrounded by fuzzy stuff, and everything is soft, and it's nice. So you have children who have a new skill set. They stand up, they do the balance thing, they take a few steps, and bam, they fall down and they hurt their bottom. And if you remember looking at them closely, before they register the pain, or they bump their head, or they stub their toe, before they register their pain, there's a look of surprise because they have never felt pain before. And it only lasts a little bit, but there's this look of surprise. I make a terrible looking baby. And then they feel the pain and they cry. And the question is, right, if we're actually doing this, building resilience, take the word out of, teen, uh, take the word teenage out, building resilience in children, what do we do? We give them two messages. We pick them up 
The first thing we say is, oh, big owie, that hurts. Second thing we say is, it's okay, you're going to be fine. Big owie, you're okay. Big owie, you're okay. One of the ways of thinking about resilience is resilience is simply the ability to tolerate and accept and have confidence in the face of disappointment, in the face of some setback in the face of pain. And what we seem to be seeing and the people who seem to be less resilient, okay, feel that what they're experiencing, they don't have the capability to deal with. But we do this with babies. Two bits of it, we don't say that doesn't hurt, act your age, which is funny because they're babies. Okay, we don't say it doesn't hurt, okay? We tell them that's a big owie. Oh, you hurt yourself. We give a kiss and we hug, but then we also tell them that's it's gonna be okay. And that seems to be when you interview resilient people that when you come right down to it, it seems to be that I'm disappointed. I'm hurt. I'm sad. Something bad has happened. I'm really suffering. I'm going to be able to get through this. And then we go to the step of how we get through it. So the question becomes, uh, we can help teens do this for themselves. And this is kind of the basis of the program we developed. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go through the program, but I am going to use it as some linchpins because this is what we've seen. That, and we, we seem to be fairly successful in doing it. We're getting nice feedback. Um, I, I live in a small town. When we first started doing this three years ago, now we're spread out through Hawks Bay. Um, I was walking down the street, and I swear to God, I was so flattered with my wife and a bunch of teenagers across the street. Hey, Mr. Resilience, how are you doing? They were enthused to be exposed to the program. So that, that itself was very gratifying. Um, what we look at is let's make me resilient. Okay, grammatically incorrect, but it's true. The question is, what can I do to become more resilient? And we look at four sessions, but really we look in terms of three content areas. Okay, the fundamental principle we look at, okay, with resilience. And again, because of my background, but also because you know we're working with youth is we use a lot of sport analogy. And the question becomes, okay, in the face of difficulty or challenge or disappointment or something happens, am I more like a basketball oh, yeah. which bounces or am I more like an egg which is brittle? And a lot of this has to do with how we perceive ourselves. And a lot of it has to do from our life experience. But if we're going to do this, one of the things we recognize is these are things that can be taught. Because again, what I'm interested in is behaviors. And when you look at the research and when you do interviews, what it turns out, and you know this for yourselves, resilient people conceptualize challenges differently from non-resilient people. They just think about them differently. In the sense, but I don't think it's a magic thing. And some people are naturally more resilient than others. I recognize that, of course. It's an aspect of personality. But for example, if I wanted to learn another skill, if I wanted to learn to play golf, I would get a coach and I would watch good golfers and I would try to do what good golfers do. Okay. If I'm a young, if I'm a young person, I want to learn to play rugby. I learned some skills. I learned to pass and tackle and kick, but then my coach shows me to think about how rugby players think of a certain situation. And it turns out that resilient people think about challenges differently and actually react to challenges a little differently. And we especially see this with teenagers. Uh, when we work with the kids, we kind of give them some um, early background. And again, what we do is we're in classrooms. We'll work with the same classroom four times. Um, we make a big point uh, in, in developing the program that we don't just identify problem kids or kids who seem to have a problem. Okay, Our, our relationship with the school is we would like to come in. And if you'd like us to work with you, we work with all the year nines. We work with all the year 10s or all the year 11s. What we try not to do is stigmatize some are resilient, some aren't. This is just a skill for everybody. And when we talk about it, and I think we can all agree with this, uh, resilience is the ability to recover quickly from hard times. Okay? Um, we do some stuff. How do we, all of us can do this right now? What do I think of as hard times? What, what is challenging for me? Um, recover from illness, depression, adversity, bad stuff. Teenagers like using a bad word, so I indicate that that's a bad word, the two stars. Um, the ability to bounce back from stress, we see. Most importantly, it's something we can learn. It's both toughness and flexibility. It's a combination of those two. If we think about the baby, nobody expects a baby to be tough, but it's okay if a baby can go, it's okay. It hurts, but I'll be fine. But the flexibility. And most important, what we see 
And we emphasize this all the way through, and I encourage everybody to think about this. It's the ability to ask for help. And we try to frame that in a sense that it's not, I don't know what I'm doing, but it's a logical, normal thing to do. And we create some parallels with that. Okay, we think about where we need to focus. And um, it, it took us a while to develop this program, but it turns out that what we focused in on are three specific but interrelated aspects. We focus on mainly cognitive strategies, how resilient people think. And again, it turns out the people who are resilient think differently from people who are not resilient. Okay, and the way they think differently, and we look at this, and you can think about this for yourselves, um, is when something for all of us, for all, for all of us, when something bad happens, we're disappointing, we're depressing, where a situation turns negative, or we get hurt, all of us, no matter who, spend some time going, oh no. Okay, this is kind of an exaggeration, but all of us go, oh no. How quickly we make the jump from, oh no, to what should I do now, seems to be an indicator of resilience. People who aren't, aren't resilient, they just go, oh no, oh no, this is terrible, oh no, there's nothing I can do. People who are resilient seem to go, oh no, oh no, hmm, what do I need to do now? I wish it was more complicated than that. But again, it's a cognitive strategy. But you'll recognize, okay, the emotional subtext there. If I can, if I have the emotional strength to say to myself, what should I do now? That creates the assumption that I have the capability of doing something, of dealing with this, of handling this. But if we know anything about behavioral psychology, we know that what we do affects how we feel. So by saying, what can I do now? Or what should I do now? Those words, that thought affects my feelings. And, hmm, maybe I can do something because the assumption is there. Um, usually, and I'll ask all of you do this to do this on your own. I can't obviously, you know, can't make you. And it's fun when we all do it as a group, but there's a lot of us here today. <coughs> Excuse me. I'd like, and here's, here's the primary example of this. Okay, and again, it's behavioral psychology. What we do affects how we feel. I would like all of you to take a minute and hopefully you're alone or explain what's happening and you gotta repeat after me. And I'm gonna ask that you say it out loud and hopefully you're alone. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna repeat something. Okay, I want you to repeat the words, I suck. Okay, I suck. I suck. Okay, now I want you to repeat the words, yay me. Yay me. Yay me. Here's a prediction I'm willing to make. All of you feel a little bit differently after you say yay me than after you say I suck. All of you, your voice has changed a little bit. And when your voice changed a little bit, that helped you feel a little bit differently. Behavioral psychology. So let's try, even though you know it, you know it now, and it's not fairly obvious, try it again. I suck. Yay me you still feel better. It's a behavioral intervention. What should I do now? The second thing we look at is how to manage stress. Because obviously everything we look at, you know, it sounds easier than it is. And I, I always tell everybody, everything I talk about is very, very simple, but it really is not very easy. I recognize that, okay? But when we look at managing stress and with teenagers, and I'd like you to think about this, especially if you have your own, the kind of stress we focus on primarily are the situations that they can't change, right? And one of the things we know, if you remember from when you were a teenager, you know, I, I don't, you know, it's a great time to be a teenager, but the stuff that bothers you at 15 does not bother you at 25. You have more choices. One of the challenges of being a teenager, even if you have a fabulous life, is that you have no control or you have to go to school. Depending on where you go, you have to wear those charming uniforms. Okay, you have to, even though you love your family, you have to live with these people, right? So teenagers, and like most of us, but in a different way, teenagers have an endless series of situations that are stressful that they cannot change. So what we do is we teach some behavioral interventions, and I'll talk a little bit about those, but what do you do when you can't change the situation? And then finally, the third component, right? If the current first component is how we conceptualize stuff, cognitive strategies, the second component is how we handle the stress when we can't change something. The third component, obviously, is making difficult conversations easier. 
How do we talk to people about things that are important for us to talk to them about? And we spend some time with that. Okay, so real briefly, and again, um, I'm gonna go ahead and show this. I think we have some time. And if I can make this work right. I love this video a lot. Okay. And this is almost everything we need to see about, know about resilience, okay, in just a couple of seconds, in two minutes and 21 seconds. Okay, um, I just wanna say, uh, this is a US team selection. I think it's back in about 2008. Um, these women are competing to get on the US Olympic team for the 600 meter relay and also some other events. They're running heaps, so you see four of them running, but these it started out with a group of 20. They run against each other all day. And the woman we're looking at, the girl we're looking at is this athlete here, and that's who they're talking about because she's favored to win. They're pretty sure she's gonna win. And what I like about her is she has a definite strategy. And if you know anything about sport, if you have teenagers, you know to function at this level is an investment of your entire family, right? There's conditioning, there's training, there's trips, there's track and field, whatever sport you're interested. So this girl looks like she's gonna win. Um, she has a strategy that they're talking about. And her strategy, if you'll notice, it's three laps. And what she does after the first lap is she gets behind the girl that's in front. And what she says is she likes to stay behind that girl for a lap. And she wants that girl to hear her footsteps. So basically she's not as nice as she looks. She likes to freak the other girl out. And then in the third lap, she takes over, okay? So she's resilient and she has a plan. We'll try this. If I can make it work. She's number three now. Three laps, we're in this event, 600 meters, three times around the 200 meter track here at the field house. What a bold move by Fawn. She's looking very confident, and the Penn State runner is just running amazing today. She did win her meet in the 400, but ended up taking fourth overall. That's Fawn Dorn. Now she's number two. Dorn has been running second. Dorn last year scored 23 points for the Golden Gophers in their Big Ten Championship. So Spend some time talking about that. Um, and again, for me, it's phenomenal and it's wonderful. But the main thing I'm interested in is what do you think she was thinking at every step of the way? We spend some time, right? So she has a strategy. She has a plan. Things are going well. She's behind the girl. She's going to take over. Then out of nowhere, whack, the entire plan changes. No more plan. Right? If you notice, there's this period of time where she trips and she's bouncing across the ground on her face. Okay. The th question is, well, how we know she's resilient is how quickly she went from, oh no, and all I can imagine is the first thing she felt was absolute panic. For God's sake, after all I've done, and my family's done and everybody, it's hard to tell, you know, all things. But there was this point of, oh no, how quickly she went from, oh no, to get up and run really, really fast, okay? And if she had waited another second, it's cool that she won, right? But I'm more impressed that she just got up. Nobody would have blamed her if she just laid there and went, oh my gosh, my gosh, I'm terrible, or damn, or swore, or walked off. Nobody would have blamed her. So what we look at is 
cognitive strategies. What did she think? What did she do with those emotions? Okay, and then what did she tell herself? Okay, so I, I like that, and that kind of sets the basis. I asked the students, we asked the students, and if you're working with your own teenagers, to pick a challenge, right? If you can spend some time being resilient, I mean, the challenge is what you question is, what's hard for you? Okay, and then the question is, if I was resilient, what would I do? Okay. Um, I give an example. The number one thing we look at, and I, I can't emphasize this enough. Um, so we, look, we looked at this, and um, uh, this is Valerie Adams. I put up some other things, the All Blacks, some other athletes, and everybody knows who she is, one of the best athletes in the world. Uh, she's won like, you know, eight Olympic medals, two gold, silvers, bronze, um, hell of a gene pool. Her, if you know, her, her brother is Steve Adams, who's one of the best basketball players in the world. So they have, they have some good genes going on there, right? But here's the question I ask. How many coaches does she have? And the answer is, depending on where she is, Valerie Adams has between six and seven coaches. Okay, she has obviously a technique coach, a strength and conditioning coach, obviously a mental skills coach, uh, which is what I do. Uh, she has a nutritional coach. She has, um, you know, a strategy coach. She has a lot of them. Um, I'll, put up, I'll put up a picture of the All Blacks. How many coaches do the All Blacks have? Depending on the season, All Blacks have between 17 and 20 coaches, right? Um, you know, offense, defense, main coach, scrum coach, passing coach, kicking coach. And the only reason I bring this up is you have the best athletes in the world. And this, I swear, this is the big difference for teenagers because teenagers tend to be so self-conscious. These are the best athletes in the world. The only thing coaches do is they give their athletes help. There's no athlete in the world who doesn't go to the coach and go, what's going on? Turns out the number one thing resilient people do is they ask for help. They talk to somebody, but they don't interpret it as there's something wrong with me. They interpret it as such, I need to seek some advice. I need to get some help. Um, six months ago, I believe about six months ago, Hawks Bay held a um, track and field. Valerie Adams came out. I forget which one it was. She came out. Um, she was shot putting. And um, I wasn't there, but a friend of mine was there who knows her, one of her coaches. And he says it was amazing. On her first try, if you know anything about sports, it didn't go as well as she'd hoped. She turned around. She didn't go, oh, I did terrible. She turned around and she walked over to her coach. And they started consulting. That's an aspect of resilience. Can we allow our teenager ourselves, when things aren't going well, to reach out and ask for somebody for some feedback from input? Because it does a lot of things. Sometimes you get a different perspective. Also, it helps you take the pressure off yourself. It isn't just that you failed in some way. So we look at that, right? And then what we do is we actually have, and I, I won't go into this, but it, I would go briefly, three ways that resilient people think. And we have three different strategies. And we spent some time talking about this, but um, I'll give you the short versions, the short versions. Okay, the first strategy we have is what we call values to action. The second strategy we have is what we call GPS method. Third strategy we have is what we call sport think. So for example, oops. Values to action simply asks one question or two questions. In this situation, what kind of person do I wanna be? And all of us can ask this question, right? So with teenagers, if we're in class, you know, we start simple. How many of you would like to be a nice person? And most of the kids raise their hand, okay? The second question is, is if I was that kind of person, what would I do now? Turns out that resilient people, some, are able to say to themselves, I wish I was more confident. Okay, I wish I was braver. I just got to be less impatient. I have to be nicer. But they're also able to ask themselves, whether they think about it or not, is if I was nicer, what would I do now? And then they do that. Right? It's all about behavior. It's a behavioral intervention. Right, so we ask the students, for example, you know, how many of you would like to be a good student? Usually we get, depending on the school we're in, usually get some laughter or everybody raises their hand or not, okay? But some, most people raise their hand, okay? If you were a good student, what would you do? Everybody has the answer, I would study. It's a behavioral intervention. 
but it seems, you know, how many, you know, would like to be more confident, okay? If I was more confident, what would I do? Well, I'd keep my head up and I might talk louder. If I wasn't sure, I might talk to somebody for advice, right? So the first thing we look at, values to action. But we ask the question, we help them ask the question, right? And you see this in sport all the time, which is why I use the example of sport, okay? If I was a good rugby player, what would I do? I would train. If I was a good racer, a runner, what would I do? I would work on my technique. If I was good, a good swimmer, what would I do? I would strengthen out my stroke, lengthen out my stroke. Second, second thing we look at, which is my personal favorite, and I'm still pretty sure I invented this, although somebody else may have thought about it, is what we call the GPS method. And we spend some time, but just briefly, okay? Everybody knows how a GPS works. Okay, and again, this is the, the question the girl on the, who fell down asked herself. Okay, GPS basically triangulates, right? So I put, I'm in Hawks Bay right now. I put Wellington, goes to a satellite, goes to Wellington, comes back, and it gives me information. Okay, and the thing I ask most of the students, or we ask, and you can ask yourself, okay, so once you have the GPS set, what does your GPS tell you? And just answer that for yourselves right now. What does your GPS tell you? Uh, most of you will say directions. Most of you will say distance. As it turns out, we can go around all day. The only thing a GPS tells you, and by tells you, I mean literally the sound coming out of the little thing is, the only thing a GPS tells you is what to do next. It doesn't tell you the route. It tells you what to do next. Resilient people seem to be able to make that jump, right? What should I do now? Right? So instead of, oh, no, oh, no, it's what should I do now? Okay, the GPS doesn't look at me and go, I don't know, it's pretty far, or it's awful late. There's a lot of traffic. No, all it says is go to the corner and turn left. Go to the next corner and turn right. Okay, and more importantly, my favorite thing about this is if, if you think about your GPS, and when we first had these, I used to do this all the time when my kids were in the car, is GPS tells me go to the corner and turn left, I would turn right. And the reason I did that is unlike a lot of our egos, if we tend to be not resilient or self-critical, the GPS doesn't go, you are such a jerk. I told you to turn left. I'm not going to work with you anymore. You're an idiot. What's wrong with you? GPS doesn't care. GPS just says, go to the next corner and turn left. If I turn right again, GPS, more important, the GPS has my back. GPS says, go to the next corner and turn left. Wherever I am, no matter how many mistakes I make, GPS just tells me what I need to do next, okay? Resilient people seem to do that. But I, my belief, again, behaviorally, right? I suck, yay me, is by thinking in those terms, we can learn to do that. And we seem to be having evidence for that. Final thing we think about is called sport think. And basically, this is just a matter of prioritizing, where basically we think, you know, if you're gonna do some one of these, what do you work on first? Right. Um, if you do sport coaching or any kind of mentoring, for those of you that are counselors, you know we only have four things we work on. Only we only have four tools. Okay, and these tools either work for us or against us. Okay, we either have our thoughts. Our thoughts work for us or against us. We have our feelings. How we feel works for us or against us. We have our actions, our behaviors, what we do, works for us or against us. Okay, and our relationships either work for us or against us. And what we're normally asked to do, and I'm sure you guys do this, is you need to find which is your door in. Which is the door in? Because all of these things overlap. But for some of us, if we have a stressful day ahead of us, I write down a list of things to do. That means your thoughts work first. For some of us, I have a big day ahead of me. What I do personally, I put in some music I like that puts me in the right mood. Okay, so what I try to do is I adjust my emotions and that allows me to organize my thoughts. Some of us have rituals, okay? I go for a run, I, you know, I do whatever, I always have a certain cup of tea, I always go for a walk, I always do some meditation. And so I do an action that again, allows me to organize my thoughts, my feelings. Or some of us have relationships. You know, maybe I call up somebody I love or before I go, I need a hug at the door, which helps, okay? So those are what we think in terms of cognitive strategies. We talk about managing stress made easy. And again, what we're interested in is stress activities for when you can't change the situation, 
which is kind of endemic of what teenagers experience. They have so little control over their lives. Basically, you know, if we want to call anything the terrible twos, we should call 15, 16, 17 years old the terrible twos, because that's almost the only control they have. No, I don't want to do it. You can hear them saying it, even if they don't say it out of their mouths. Okay. Okay. So we talk about stress. Um, in the last 20 years or so, we've, got, we've given stress a bad rap. Um, if any of you hear TED Talks, um, I forget the woman's name, um, but if you look up a TED Talk and you go to stress, she's done tremendous new research. <laughs> she's one of those brilliant people. She looks like she's 12, but she teaches at Harvard, right? Uh, but if you look up TED and stress, and she's done remarkable research, and it turns out stress, you know, we keep saying how bad stress is. Stress is only bad for you if you think it's bad for you. If you say to yourself, oh, I have a big week ahead, of course I'm under stress, I have to perform, turns out it's okay. And we have that example from sport. So we talk about stress in general. We talk about what's really crucial, and it helps our teenagers understand this, that there's good stress and bad stress. If you're excited about doing something, that's a form of stress. Okay, um, anything you prepare for has to do with stress. So you need stress in sports, there's stress when you have fun, there's stress if you're doing social stuff. So there's good stress. We also will talk about the fact that there's bad stress. More importantly, and I, I think all of us realize this, you know, that amazing things can happen under stress. I, I joke with them that the reason we moved to New Zealand is I took this picture and we were out in a boat and I saw this cow swimming with this dolphin. None of them ever believed me, but that's beside the point, okay? We ask them, and I, we can all think about this, what makes you stress? What you'll notice, and we all know this, is what makes one person stressed doesn't make somebody else stressed. If you have good friends, if you have somebody in the family, or if you have a uh, spouse or a partner or whatever, you recognize that what makes you stressed may not make them stressed. So sometimes you can give them advice, they can give you advice. Sometimes if we're stressed enough, we don't want to hear it. But it's important identifying the kind of things that cause stress. Then we talk about, most importantly, that there are two stress emotions. Okay? One is we're stressed when we worry about the future. Okay? What is that called? It's called anxiety, right? And it's one of the most, one of the major okay, things that we prescribe medication for right now is anti-anxiety medication. All anxiety is, is okay, conceptualizing, worrying, and focusing on the future without a specific thing, right? It's, it's you know, generalized anxiety. It's all the manifestations of fear, but you don't have the fear, right? So one of the things that gives us stress is we spend a lot of time worrying about the future. The other thing that gives us stress is we dwell on the past on things we can't change, right? If we're mad about something, if I can't believe how stupid I was, I did something dumb, I embarrassed myself or somebody hurt me and I can't get over that, I focus on the past. Anytime we're under stress, I guarantee you, yourselves, myself, anybody we know, if we're under stress, if we're experiencing stress, we're worried about the future, anxiety, okay, we're dwelling on the past. Psychologists will tell you that depression is anger turned inward. We focus on the past, right? So if the future is stressful, now this isn't bad. We need this also, right? You need to worry about it. So I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it is. Okay, if the future is stressful, the past is stressful, what is, where is the point in time that we reduce stress? In the present, okay? So what we do then is once we conceptualize that, we talk to the students, we get them to act that out, you can do this with your own teenagers. We do three activities that all these do is allow you to focus on the present. We're not gonna do stress management techniques now, but this is important to conceptualize, okay? Regardless, and, and that's why one, one of the things we see, we're seeing more stress, uh, we're seeing higher levels of uh, teen anxiety, higher levels of suicide, higher levels of teen depression. My belief is part of it is because teenagers and all of us are spending so much time thinking about what's going to happen or what did happen or what we're missing out, okay? And it's because of this. Okay, if you get a chance, there's a brilliant article out of The Atlantic. Uh, it's about three or four years old now. It talks about the number one factor, and they, uh, they did a study, it didn't include New Zealand, but they did a study, US, Canada, and Australia. The number one factor, identifiable, certifiable factor related to youth anxiety, youth depression, youth suicidal thoughts, is the number of minutes a day they spend on the device. 
Okay. It isn't that this is evil. And I, I always worry, I sound like some guy years ago who went, uh-uh, we're not going to use fire in my cave. It isn't literally that, right? Or that wheel, uh-uh, that's bad. Okay. But what we know is when you're doing this and think about ourselves, it's always about where we're not, what we need to do, what did we miss? It's always about displacing us out of the present. So we teach three really, really simple, immediate stress management techniques that you can do to center yourself to reduce your stress. And you can feel them immediately, but there's tons of them you can find. Um, so we do this, we do it in class for the students, we do it, and they prepare before they have to take a test. And, and again, most of this we get out of support, right? So we, we think in terms of stress management, it's low cognition. It's actively engaging thoughts, emotions, okay, and behaviors. So we look at that. Um, there's nothing that reduces your stress as much as gasping for air. Um, when I do clinical work, for example, if I work with uh, depressed patients, we make, we make a deal. Um, the deal is, as we're working together, you can't attempt suicide. You gotta contact me instead because that'll make me look bad. And the second thing is you have to be engaged in an exercise program. There is nothing that engages us as much in the immediate as breathing hard, right? Because you're out of breath, you catch your breath, and there's immediate sense of relief when you get enough oxygen. Short-term exercise is crucially important. And I'll tell my clients, if you have to choose between you're so busy, you have to come and see me, or you're going to do your exercise for the day, you're going to get more out of doing your exercise. And it's not hard exercise. It's a thing called target heart rate. Right. So if you're in terrible physical condition, you may hit your target heart rate just by trying to walk around the block. That's fine. If you're in brilliant physical condition, you may have to actually run or get on a stairmaster, do something intense. The target heart rate means you maintain a, a period of time where you're, you're in oxygen deficit. The thing that removes that or replaces that is regaining your oxygen, oxygen, catching your breath. Second thing. Third thing we look at. Okay, so then we give them some key points. Um, through Fiona, I'm gonna send all of you a, a PDF about all these slides, if you're interested. Um, there's also some contact information at the bottom if you'd like to contact me. Uh, if you think your school's interested in train the trainer stuff, you can contact me, but we'll send you everything. So I see a lot of you taking notes. So we give ideas for dealing with stress for teenagers, but it turns out it's for everybody. Third thing we look at is making difficult conversations easier. Um, having a difficult conversation is often the most resilient thing you can do. And one of the things I tell them, I make the promise that um, I cheat. I just say, you know, this is what I need to tell the school. But really what we do is we teach five techniques for you to get what you want from other people. Okay, uh, so they're just conversational techniques. But again, they're easier to do if you're resilient and they're easier to do if you can manage your stress. Sorry. Okay. We know for teenagers or adolescents, um, there's two biggest challenges. One is because you have no power. It's disagreeing with your parents or disagreeing with the people you know so well. Uh, one of the things we talk about, we recognize the thing that's special about teenagerness is when you're a teenager, it's that point in time where you become reproductively viable. What that means is you can have babies. Okay, And there's a lot of theory, if you look at sociobiological theory, is why as teenagers, we get into challenges, you know, with our parents is because it is time to move on biologically, right? If you remember, if your kids remember, and I tell, I tell the teenagers this, but it's real true. When you're three years old, if you're a girl and you get something nice, first thing you do is you go show your mommy. If you're a boy and you're three years old, you have something nice, you go show your mommy or your daddy, right? If you're 15 and you have something nice, you want to show your friends. Okay, if you've done something cool, you want, your, you want your, your mates to know. We shift and it's normal, where although you love them, your parents are not the most important uh, relationships. So there's that inherent disagreement. But again, if we didn't get into fights with our parents, all of us would have babies with our cousins because nobody would leave. You know, sociobiologically what happens, I'm out of here. And you go down the, you know, you go down the hill, you cross the river, you go to the other village because they know they understand you better than your parents do. And at the same time, you pass somebody doing the same thing going to your village. So we know that. The second challenge is because peers are so important 
The hard thing is to disagree with your friends. If you notice, teenagers are designed to disagree with other people. They're designed to, you know, it's us and them to not like others. The challenge is disagreeing with your friends. So what happens is we talk about it. A lot of teenagers end up getting bullied, even though they don't understand that. You know, I'm 15. Uh, my mom and dad go, hey, look, we're going to be gone. We're going, uh, we're going out of town Saturday. You're in charge of the house. You can have one friend over, no parties, but you can order some pizza, have a movie. You can have a friend over. Cool. So I call my friend up. Hey, Matt, um, you want to come over? My parents are going to go, cool, let's have a party. I go, no, no, I can't. And he goes, come on, let's have a party. I go, no, I really, he goes, God, that is why you are such a loser. That's why nobody likes you but me, because you have an opportunity. Let's have a party. Don't be a jerk. And I go, oh, okay. We end up having a party, even though I don't want to. There's nothing wrong with me. It's just, and there's nothing wrong with Matt. He wants to have a party. He thinks it's a great idea. But it's the ability not to disagree with kids from another school. Do we have the ability to disagree with others? So social skills become important, right? We look at, again, five tricks to make difficult conversations easier, or I sell it five tricks to get what you want from others. Um, some real simple thing. One of the things we look at is how body language works. Okay, and all of you know this, right? It is easier to get into a disagreement or have an ar argument if you're face-to-face -face with somebody. That's why if you have teenagers and you have to talk to them, I don't encourage you to stand there in the living room and talk to them what's wrong with their grades or why did they do this or your principal called me or I can't believe you did this or what's wrong with you or how can you blah, 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 blah. Look what I found in your room. Okay, if you're going to have this kind of conversation, okay, you sit on the couch next to them. You're more likely to get into a disagreement facing somebody. And when you're in a disagreement, you always end up facing somebody. I don't know if any of you have ever been on, you know, sitting in your living room on the couch and you're watching TV with your husband or wife or boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever it is, and you start arguing, somebody always gets up and turns to the other person. So if you have difficult things to talk, and I tell, I, we tell the students this, if you have someone to tell your mom this challenging, ask her to sit on the couch again. Talk to them while you're driving in the car. Sit on the step in front of the house. Sit on the curb, go for a walk. Okay, so we play a lot of stuff with body language. Okay. Um, Friendly conversations, comfortable conversations, people usually sit at an angle, stand at an angle. If you, and if you go out somewhere and just watch people, hardly anybody faces each other. There's a slight angle that allows for closeness, yet it isn't confrontational. Okay, if you have something to share with somebody, we advise it shoulder to shoulder. Okay, and there's all kinds of research that supports this. We talk about how to say no, which is a crucial, a crucial skill. Right. And it turns out you don't want to be argumentative. You want to say no, you know, in the same way, you know, an apple is red, my shirt is black. The answer is no. You dress it up, but that's important. For teenagers, being able to say no and being comfortable, not feeling guilty is useful. Um, we talk about front loading, which is a method to have difficult conversations. Okay. And the bottom line about front loading is we usually say, I'm conscious of time. Um, there's four reasons why it's hard for somebody to talk about something, especially teenagers. One is you don't want to make somebody mad. The other is you don't want to hurt their feelings. The other is you just, you know, you're embarrassed, which is big. And the other is you just don't know what to say. And so that keeps you from saying what you need to say. Turns out if you front load and you say, I need to talk to you, but I'm really embarrassed. That gives you all the freedom in the world to do that, right? If you think about somebody you like, somebody who knows you, just you, all of you guys listening, and someone comes up to you and goes, hey, um, hey, Edmund, I got to talk to you about something, but I don't want you to get upset. What am I going to do? I'm going to say, well, what is it? That means I invite you to say it. Hey, I need to talk to you, but I'm embarrassed. So come on, just tell me. I invite you to say it. Turns out that's a really useful tool. If you have to tell your mom something, your dad something, or teacher something, you know, um, Mr. Jones, uh, I need to ask you something, but I'm a little bit embarrassed. Well, what is it? Right there, the person has invited you to say that. I need an extension on my paper. You get more juice out of it than that. Okay, so we play with that a lot. We do some skills, but front loading is crucial. Um, there's another skill called the feedback sequence, how you dialogue. Um, and again, <laughs> I love my slide. We encourage people never, ever, ever, 
ever, ever, ever tell anyone to calm down, right? Because nothing makes someone want to hit you in the head with a cricket bat as much as them telling you to calm down. So we come up with some alternatives, okay? Because calm down, you're just going to get into a fight. Okay, it turns out the alternative is anytime you're tempted to tell somebody to calm down, you say something like, you know, I know this is important to you. I can see this is important to you. Not I know how you feel, because that just makes someone argue with you more. But if you're genuine, I know this is important to you. Eventually, we see that they'll calm down. Okay, and then we go over, we kind of review. Um, we encourage people to be brave enough to start a conversation that matters. We think that these skills help. Okay, mm -hmm. and we reinforce this over and over again. Resilient people always ask for help when they need it. Maybe that's what makes them resilient. So in speaking to the fact that this is a program we use, I want to go over the fact that it seems, and what we look at, if it goes fast, huh? Okay. If toddlers learned this lesson, it hurts, but I'm okay. It hurts, but I'm going to be fine. It hurts, but I can handle this. They end up being more resilient. If they never learn this lesson, we have to end up teaching it. But my belief is we teach it behaviorally. It doesn't help teenagers sit down and go, you're a good person. Well, I know I'm a good person. But the question is, okay, when something goes wrong, what should you think? What should you do? When you need to talk to somebody, how do you say it? So the behavioral interventions become really, really useful. That's kind of, that's kind of what we think about. Um, is any, Fiona, did anybody write anything in? Um, a lot of people loving your uh, GPS analogy. <laughs> yeah, it's good, huh? I love that. I love that. <laughs> um, we do have one question from Sherry. How do you teach a pre-teenager about social skills to understand the impact their approach has on others, especially when they can't see how they're doing something is putting people off and obviously doing this without making them feel terrible? Well, here, here's my thought. Um, I think we're working from the assumption that if I was just tell them, you know, when you act like that, people don't like you, that we're assuming that they're too vulnerable to hear that. Okay, that's kind of the opposite of the principle with the toddlers. Okay, I think if they love you and they know you support them, you know, I need to talk to you honestly. You know, when you say that, it's gonna push people the other way. It's gonna push them the wrong way. And part of it is making the assumption that the, our teenager is resilient. Okay, it's, change is difficult, you know, and then you could say, you know, here's another thing you might want to say, and I, I, would, I would give them the freedom then. Okay, if you want someone to be mad at you, you can go ahead and say that. But I have to tell you, you acting like that is what makes them upset at you. Would you like a different response? Maybe you can do something differently. I really believe, you know, we, we need to look out for all of ours, you know, teenager well-being and stuff. But I think sometimes we prescribe resilience, uh, we, we prescribe insecurity, and we, we determine that they're going to be upset just because, you know, we tell them the honest truth of what's going on. So I would be really, really supportive. I would be really honest with them. You know, I can't help noticing you may not want to hear this. Please hear me out. But when you do this, that's, that seems to be what makes people not want to deal with you. Or that seems to be what makes people, just be honest with them. I love you dearly. You know, you're a great boy. You're a fabulous girl. But if you want to have more friends, you may want to think about changing some of these behaviors. And you give them the option. They have the option to change the behavior. You know, so that, that's, that's my thought. But I, I look at it from a very coaching. And the second thing I would do is I would show them how to do it, what to say instead. You might say this instead. Um, sometimes you have to wait for them to come to you. You know, God, everybody's just so mean to me. Why is that? So those are my thoughts. Debbie's got a tough one. She asks, how would you do this with a non-verbal disabled teenager, often with differing cognitive abilities? Uh, you introduce, you know, and of course that's a challenge. You introduce the amount of information they can absorb. You know, um, you communicate them with them at, on, in whichever ways you are communicating with them. You know, um, if they're cognitive enough to make a choice, you know, what should you do now? 
you encourage that. I mean, the verbal stuff may not be, but the nonverbal stuff is. Uh, I'm not sure what, what quite the level of, of cognition is available to work for. But if they can understand you, you know, I believe they can understand, well, maybe there's a different way to look at this. Maybe there's a different way to understand this. Um, that, that, become, that becomes challenging, but it's hard to talk about without understanding uh, the level of cognitive impairment. Sure. Yeah. Um, somebody asked, what is an alternative to short-term exercises for a teen that's not physically capable of exercising? Um, you know, again, I'm not sure how much capability is involved in this, but I'll give everybody an example. I don't want to go over the time. I know you're time. Let me, let me give you an example of what we call, um, okay, it, it's kind of a, a version, okay, of one of the exercises we do. Everybody just make a fist, okay? Put it close to your chest. And I want you to take 15 seconds and squeeze your arms and your fist and your shoulders absolutely as hard as you can. Really, really hard. Squeeze harder, squeeze harder. Okay, or you can squeeze your legs, squeeze something absolutely as hard as you can. A little bit harder, a little bit harder. I can't believe you're videoing this. A little bit harder, a little bit harder, tighter, tighter. Okay, you're doing good if you can give yourself a nosebleed. A little harder, a little harder, a little harder, wait. Okay, let go. Okay, now most of you, when you let go, you let out a little sigh because you felt a sense of relief in relaxing your arms. That sense of relief reduced your stress. It isn't the clutching that did it, but by relieving your body, what you did is you put yourself under more stress and then you experienced relief. When you experience relief, your brain chemicals change just a little bit. And right now, because of the relief you're feeling in your arms, you feel a little bit better than you did before. That's all I'm talking about. Okay, when you squeeze as tight as you can, you're not thinking about anything else. Okay, whether you're worried about what's going on this afternoon or if you said something stupid or this, when you squeeze as tight as you can, you're not thinking about anything else. And then when you relax, ah, that feels good. When I do this with a group full of kids, you can hear the whole room sigh. Ah, no big deal. That's all I'm talking about, right? Or can you do something that focuses you on the immediate? Okay, just, you just need some time just to be in the moment. Uh, some people call it flow. So if you can do that level of physicality, that can help you. The trouble is we live in a society where we're only worried about what's gonna happen and we're always thinking about what did happen. We need little bits and, that, and that's why, you know, there's so many addictions going on because uh, people get a hold of something, you know, whether it's uh, pee or alcohol or whatever, and that, that gives them that temporary sense of relief. Okay, but then they have to keep going back to it and it doesn't quite satisfy. And this isn't a, a thing about drugs or whatever. You know, some people can drink fine, some people can't. That's not the deal. But if you're using it to reduce your anxiety, you reach a point of tolerance where you need more and more. But anyway, it's as simple as that. Something physical that you engage or something that you just think about this now and you give yourself a little break. Um, super quickly, we've got like, three, four minutes, one last one. How would you support your preteen to be friendly towards the person that no one wants to be friends with? Um, I, would, I would go with what kind of person do you want to be? Uh, I'd like, we'd like to be a nice person. Well, maybe that'd be a nice thing to do. Um, on the other hand, again, we don't know. I mean, perhaps there's a reason nobody wants to be friends with this person, <laughs> you know, so it goes both ways, you know, uh, but if it's someone who you could reach out to, I would, you know, what, what, what will be the gain your pre-teenager would get? Okay, do you want to be a nice person? Well, here's something you could do that's nice. Okay, how would you feel? And you, you know, you develop some empathy skills, but again, what, what I would do is what we used to do is I encourage a behavior. Maybe you can just say hi to that person. But again, uh, if they totally don't like them, it's different. But if it's just someone that nobody notices and you're recognizing this would be a good thing to do, maybe you know you encourage your behavior. Maybe you can say nice, say something hi, say hi, say something nice to them, encourage them. How would that make you feel if you made somebody feel better? Um, you always want to tie in behavior plus emotions plus words plus relationships, right? It's that kind of dialogue back and forth. Anyway, I think we are right at. We are. Hang on. Yeah. I am so proud of myself because I just keep talking. <laughs> um, every, everybody, seriously, I wish I could see all of you. I see some of your faces. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Lila. Hi, Allison. 
Okay, um, so I can see some of you. Um, Fiona will send you out a PDF of these if you're interested. Yes, there's okay. been lots um, of requests, yeah. You know, I, I'd, I'd be delighted. Uh, there's so much good work being done. Um, my emails, if you ever want to chit chat, I'm happy to. But anyway, thank you all very much. Fiona, thank you so much and for everybody that's doing this. Thank you, Edmund. There's just so, so much love in the chat box. I'll, um, I'll oh, read wait. through it, but yeah. One, one last thing, one last thing I always say, I do this every single day. Every day as I'm shaving, I swear to God, it's silly. I shut the door. I say, yay me, seriously. <laughs> it, it's funny. It makes you feel good every time you say it. Just say, just say. Bye-bye. Yay me. Yay me, exactly. Thanks, Edmund. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.